back in Isaiah 53 to, to finish out this last little section we we talked about um, I think we got through most of verses 1 through 9 and uh, we saw this is very odd for a description of what we thought was a description of a king of uh, one who would come to save um, God's people and uh, and then it, it just sort of turns dark it turns kind of depressing in a sense and it seems like he this guy is, is not really the picture of a conquering hero that we would think but this isn't a description of a hero in his glorious victory as the world would see it this is the description of a servant who comes God's servant isn't it interesting at the outset that when God is describing how he's going to save his people and give them hope Remember Isaiah, he didn't have a lot of good news, right? This is a time when you've got the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, they're being conquered, they're being basically indicted by God for having defied his law, having rejected him, having worshipped idols. Um, and there's not a lot of good news about what's about to happen. Nevertheless, in the middle of God saying, judgment is coming, if this ship doesn't turn around, nevertheless, I'm going to bring a savior. I'm going to set this right. I'm not going to abandon you forever. I'm not going to leave you hopeless. I'm not going to leave you as the victim of all of these things. Discipline is coming because I told you it would. I told you not to do these things. Don't worship other gods that aren't gods. Your stone and your wood, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have mouths, but they don't talk. I am the living God. Worship me only. Trust me to provide by taking that day and resting that day and focusing on me and what I've done because I took a day. All this I made in six days and you've got six days to do your work, but honor me on the seventh. Matter of fact, every seven years, every seventh seven of years, let the land rest, you rest. I will provide for you so that you understand as you follow my word, follow my will, my ways, and you receive my provision for you. I am your king. I am the only God. And this group of people did not do it. And he warned them and he warned them. And discipline was necessary. These prophets don't have, I mean, it's not a fun job to be called by God to issue these things. Right. Jeremiah had a heck of a time. Remember Jesus' words, right? When he would weep over Jerusalem. And what did he say, what did he say about this city? This is the place where the prophets come and get stoned. He wasn't talking about drug use. He was talking about, this is the place, my holy city where I send my people and you've killed them because you didn't want to hear what they had to say. Because what they had to say was, you are walking in disobedience to the Lord. The Lord is just. He is holy. He is not to be trifled with. He is not to be disobeyed. He is not a liar. Discipline is coming for kids who get out of line. Not because he hates you in a sense that he despises you. You were given his name. You were given the promises. He told you who he was. He was near to you. Do you forget how he saved you? Do you forget all the things he's done for you? And this is how you repay him. We've got to take care of this. People didn't want to hear that. And Isaiah comes and he's describing to them what God would have him say about the Lord's coming salvation sounds great. There's peace coming. There's deliverance coming. There's salvation coming. God bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and the ends of all the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Yes, the oppression is going to be done. The oppression is going to be over. We're going to be back on top. We're going to be back where we belong and things are going to be great. And then God says, and to do it, I'm going to send a servant. Okay, that seems fine. And then you read about this servant and you just think, what? 
he's going to, he's, he's not going to be all that spectacular looking. He's not really going to be worth paying a lot of attention to. He's going to be a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like this, this is not, this doesn't seem right. Like sure, this can't be God's man. Right? You remember Paul and his wrestling with Corinth and these super apostles who had come in and they say, see this Paul? He suffers. He travels all over. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's, you know, he's having to just work to get by making tents. Like, this is not God's man. He's not healthy, wealthy, and prominent. It's this little old man who's weak, probably doesn't see very well. He's got to tell people just when he's writing it in himself just so they'll believe it. And Paul says, listen, that's not what makes a man of God, not his bank account, not his prestige, not his reputation, none of those things. I came to you with the word of God and the power of God, Christ and him crucified, that's it. In fact, those sufferings that those people are saying are evidence that I'm not God's man, that's precisely how you know that God has sent me on this mission because God has preserved us through all of these things. And if we suffer, we suffer for your sake. Why was I shipwrecked? Because on my, I was on my way to preach the gospel to you because God says, preach the gospel and you're worth it. He said, go to them, I'm going to you. Despite the shipwreck, despite the hostility, despite being thrown in prison, despite all those things. And remember Jesus' words, right? In this world, you will have trouble. If the world hates you, it's because the world hates me. Because I say, I'm the only way. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way. I'm the maker. I'm the creator. I'm the savior. And so people got excited about it. They said, yes, all right, let's go. And let's storm the castle, right? Let's storm Jerusalem. But when this Jesus begins to act like this servant guy, who they had kind of thought was all about them, poor, woe is me, I'm going to suffer, but God will you know, redeem me in the end. Jesus says, no, it's, not, it's not you, it's me. What happened? They turned on him. And this crowd that's sing, singing, Jose, I know next Sunday is Palm Sunday, but Hosanna, right? Here comes the king. Here's the guy who's going to kick the Romans out. Here's the guy who's finally going to set us back on top. Here is the arm of the Lord that he promised. And he doesn't take the castle. He doesn't storm the capital. He doesn't do any of those things. They despise him. They turn on him. They want him dead. Little did they know. <laughs> this was the servant they had been waiting for. And every bit of vile, every bit of hostility and anger, and finger-pointing, and head-wagging that had all been written about hundreds of years before. It was exactly as God said it would happen. This is how you'll know. And it makes you wonder if this might not have been one of the passages on the road to Emmaus when Jesus shows up and they don't know it's him and it says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets that Jesus opened their minds and their eyes to the scripture about how all of this was about him. Do you not know? Have you not read? This is how it was supposed to happen. That's how you know it's me. Before we read this passage, let's ask that God would open our eyes open our hearts and minds to understand God coming to us, to his people and saying, this is my son. This is my way of salvation. This is me coming to you. Father, we, we with our human ways of thinking and understanding, we just don't always make very good sense of things. Matter of fact, God, we make a mess of things more often than not. And we need you to help us understand and help us to see Jesus. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to see your salvation. Help us to see ourselves and our sin and need of him and the great gracious salvation that is found through Christ and none other. Father, only you can do this. Only you can make dead hearts in dead bodies come to life through new hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. 
Only you can grow us and conform us more and more into the image of your son because you are the potter and we are the clay. Father, would you have your will and way with us now that you would be glorified in all things. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. I'm going to start here back in in Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Do you reckon Joseph of Arimathea thought, as we we pick up there sort of around in 10, before we leave 9, do you reckon he... He was thinking about this. Remember the story, right? Where they come for the body of Jesus. Jesus didn't own property. He wasn't a rich man. In fact, he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. So a rich man comes forward, Joseph of Arimathea, and asks for the body and gives him this new tomb, the tomb of a rich man. Joseph was born hundreds of years after this was written. Yet there it is. There it is. A tomb with the rich. This suffering poor servant, how would he have a tomb with the rich? It's it's impossible to look at this and to look at the account of the historical record of the life of Jesus Christ and not see that this is the man. Like it or not, this is the man. This is the man. And that's what Pilate said. And he didn't even know what he was saying, right? takes him in, he takes him out. He's trying to figure out, I don't think this guy is guilty. Finally, he doesn't want the trouble and he brings out Jesus and he says what? Behold the man. This is him. We pick up here in verse 10 and we find out that all of this, all this suffering, all this anguish, this oppression and judgment, this wrongly being accused for the sake of others, the we all like sheep who've gone astray and all that iniquity is laid on the back of this man who didn't do anything wrong. There was no violence in his mouth. He, he wasn't a sinner. Yet he was punished for all of these sinners. And we find out in verse 10 that it was the will of the Lord. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Makes me think of Acts and that great sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes Just like Jesus said, right? I'm going to go. I'm going to send back to my father until I I should return in judgment and end all things. But in the meantime, I'm going to send my spirit to be within you. And you wait. 
Because what needs to be done can't be done by you. What needs to be done is done by the power of God. I will send my spirit to be with you, to teach you, to speak through you, to give evidence that it is him and that you are the people telling the truth. And so this happens. It's a pretty wild event. Suddenly these people in Jerusalem hear these guys up there, these Galileans and whatnot, speaking languages from all over the world that there's no way they could have known. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't babbling. It wasn't gobbledygook. That's not the, the, uh, uh, the tongues. They were people from all over the world who had come back to Jerusalem to celebrate and that you hear them surprised because they see these guys who are not where they came from, but they're speaking their language. I can understand them. I can understand, they're, I can understand what they're saying. There's no way they should know how to speak my language. And that's the Spirit of God came upon these people and then Peter stands up and he preaches to these people. And among the things that he says, he says in Acts 2, verse 23, I'll start in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. In other words, listen, we all know who we're talking about here. This man that you followed in the town, this man that you followed all over the hillsides because he was turning, you know, a few loaves into bread enough to feed 5,000 people. That man who was curing people of blindness and leprosy and making lame people walk. You know the one I'm talking about because you followed him around for three years, watching him do these things, asking him to heal you, watching people do receive blessing from this man. You know the man I'm talking about. That was God. And you knew it was God doing works through him. You knew that he was God's prophet. Even if you didn't understand what he was saying, that he was God in the flesh, you understood that he was from God. That one, verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Listen, this was God's plan the whole time to send this man to attest that he was who he said he was. And even though this was, God knew this was going to happen and designed it to happen this way, nevertheless, you killed this man. You crucified this man. Furthermore, God raised him up. And he goes on to tell about how, listen, this is what the Lord was saying when he said you wouldn't let your Holy One see decay. We know where David's buried wasn't David. David wrote that, but David wasn't talking about himself. It's Jesus. His tomb is empty. This is the man. This is the one for whom we waited, and you killed him. Why? Because this was God's plan. One of the great confirmations we have, we understand, and we need, we need to understand as well, one of the reasons why the world hates Christianity, its hatred of Jesus Christ, is because without any shadow of a doubt, Jesus made the exclusive claim to be God and to be the only way to God. He did not leave the door open for other ways. He did not leave the door open for other gods, other religions. He said, I am the only way you will make it back into a loving blessed relationship with your creator. And that is not palatable to sinners. It is not palatable to the world who wants some skin in the game, who wants to be able to say at the end of the day, I did all the right things, I said all the right words, I, you know, I burned all the right incense, or I prayed to the right idols, or I did all the right works I'm supposed to do, and I gave the right money, or I made the right trip to Mecca or I walked up these stairs or I visited this shrine or that. Those pursuits give us the ability to say, I've somehow done this thing. I've saved myself or I've made it better for me in the future or, or whatever the belief system is. There's something man has to do and that man can do to save himself. It's nice if God helps. Or this Roman culture who was like, okay, you know, you could bring your gods. They would go out and they would conquer people all over the world and they'd bring them back. And they were content to go, okay, listen, you can keep your God, just add ours to it. We just, 
You know, you can have you can have that God, but you can also have ours. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. Doesn't that sound familiar? You have your truth and I have mine. Don't, don't hassle me with, with, with this urgency about how unless I believe what you do, I'm not going to be saved. Your truth is good for you. I'm happy that's good. That works for you. That's fine. Leave me to believe what I believe. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't leave anybody to believe what they want to. He tells them the truth. I'm the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I'm it. And one of the great confirmations we have that that is true, other than that Jesus said it was true, we find in a garden where you have this one Savior for all mankind going with his closest disciples who had been kind of bickering and they didn't really get it. One's already left. Jesus knows where he's going and that he's coming back. And they go to this garden where they had been before. That's how Judas knew where to find them, the Bible says. Judas knew. They'd been there before. He knew where this garden was. He tells most of them to stay at the gate. He asks James and John and Peter to come with him. And the Bible says he begins to be sorrowful. And he says, okay, now you, you wait here and just pray. It says he goes on. And twice the Bible records that Jesus prays to God and says, if there's any other way, if it is possible to let this cup, what I'm about to go through, what I'm about to endure, if it is possible, let it pass. And what was God's answer? There is no other way. Sin must be paid for. The iniquity of my people must be atoned for. There is no other way. I am a holy God and I cannot wink at sin. I'm not going to just forget about it. It must be punished because it is rebellion against a righteous, holy creator of all things. It must be punished or I'm no longer just. I'm no longer good. I'm no longer rightfully sovereign and holy because I let this rebellion go on. It must be done. And the Lord Jesus himself says, if there's another way, let's investigate that option. And then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Crush him. Crush him. That is the extent of the rightful wrath of a holy God on sin. Sin is not just a oops. Worshiping other things than God defying God's wisdom, God's will, God's law. It's not a small thing. If you have an infinitely righteous God, the slightest rebellion against that is an infinitely wicked thing and requires an infinitely wrathful response. It was the will of the Lord to not just make him pay, not just slap him on the wrist, or tell him, bad boy, not even just kill him, to crush him. He has put him to grief. You see back there at the end of 52, we didn't read it this time. His, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance. beaten, a crown of very large thorns shoved into his head, whipped with a whip of leather straps, holding metal and bone and glass in the end, flaying the skin off of his back. beyond human resemblance. And not only that, mocked. Put
put on display, humiliated. His closest followers ran away. The one who said, I'll never leave, I'll never turn, I'm with you to the end, said, I don't, I don't know this man. I don't, I don't know him. This mother that we find at the cross where Jesus, I think it's John who records, where he looks at John and he looks at Mary, says, son, behold your mother. Mother, your son, he know, I'm out. You have to care for her. If this wasn't one of the things that Mary pondered in her heart when she knew, when she was told, you will have a son. You will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins and your heart will be run through with many sorrows. If she's not sitting at the foot of that cross, She's not trying to climb up there. She's not trying to get him down. She's not. She's sitting there knowing, knowing this has to happen, but probably not fully understanding why it was the will of the Lord to crush him, that his soul makes an offering for guilt, a guilt that wasn't even his. And then after we had those verses about how he was cut off, we find that he shall see his offspring and his... Days will be prolonged. What? The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This has taken a turn. This has taken a quick turn. In the middle of his being crushed, in the middle of his grief, in the middle of his being cut off and is making an offering for guilt that wasn't his, few things hurt worse than being held responsible or guilty for things that you're not guilty of. Isn't that when our sense of justice just rises up in the middle of us? To know it and not be able to do anything about it is more than we can sometimes handle, for sure more than we handle well. But you remember what Jesus told Peter. Don't you think that if in this moment I asked my father to deliver me, that he wouldn't send 12 legions of angels to pop onto the scene and do away with all this? No one takes my life. I Lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll take it up again. Because it's mine. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am doing what I was here to do. And in the middle of this darkest moment, the will of the Lord is going to prosper in his hands. He will see his offspring. His days will be prolonged. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. You know what that tells me? Jesus didn't suffer for nothing. All of those for whom he died, he will save. Period. He will be, there is no chance at all that any of his sacrifice goes unredeemed that it goes to waste, that is going to be left (laughs) to people who hate God to weigh the options for themselves and decide, yes, I'll take advantage of this. It is God who comes to save his people and move among his people with power by the Holy Spirit through the word of God being preached through the gospel that says it was this man, Jesus, who came, who was perfect in every way, who was God, who bore the punishment for the sins of his people and then was raised out of his grave three days later to prove that he was God, to prove that he was life, and to go back to the Father and to offer his perfect obedience on your behalf, to offer his sacrifice and punishment for your sin so that he may usher you into God. Now it is put to you. Do you believe? Do you trust this man? This man who said there is no other way This man who did what could not be done by you or I. No man could endure the full wrath of God and live. And no no one who wasn't God could endure that. No one but God could endure that. But no one but man could pay for his own sin. This man who was both God and man came to do both. To reconcile you back to your maker. And if you would be saved, then your faith must be in him and him only. 
that he will be satisfied. He will, what did he tell, right? John, John 5 or John 6, I think it's John 6. All those whom the Father gave me will come and I will lose not one of them. Not one of them. And he will make many. Notice it doesn't say able to be righteous. Notice it doesn't say he will make many aware of what righteousness looks like and tell them how to do it or just be a really good example. He will make many to be accounted righteous. Accounted. I mean, if you put something, I remember doing I think my FFA record book. Man, I hated that thing. I, I just, I don't think I could ever be an accountant. I really could. But like, there were a lot of times where you just, I spent a lot of time asking my advisor, like, which column am I supposed to put this in? Which color are the, is it the pink pages? Is it the green pages? Are they still different colors, Amy? Oh man, I was, just, I was terrible at that. How do I know where to account for this? Like, here's this money or this number. I have to put it somewhere. I have to put it in the right place so that it's accounted for correctly. What is God looking for on the ledger? He's handing out his eternal blessing. He's looking for 100% perfect obedience and righteousness. And he looks out at us and he doesn't see it anywhere. Until Jesus comes holding that perfect obedience, that perfect righteousness. I did everything that was supposed to be done by your image bearers. I took on flesh and I did it all. And when you write this down, I want you to write it next to the names that you wrote before the foundation of the world. It's theirs. And that sin and those other columns and the payment that was needed for that, I took care of that also. So that when you get, and at the risk of being redundant in the weeks to come, because I had intended to go to the 22nd Psalm, I would encourage you to read that this week. But just in closing, I think it fits here. We see how he's going to do all of these things. 22nd Psalm is heartbreaking. There's probably no more anguish expressed in any literature anywhere. It begins with a man who's deserted by God, who feels like God has left him. This God who promised that he never would, yet this man feels. This man who wrote in other places, you're always with me. This man who's going to write in the next chapter, you're with me in the valley of the shadow of death. Right now, this man is saying, that's not true. I don't know where you are, but you're not here. You've left me. You've forsaken me. Look at these people. They're pointing at me. They're wagging their heads. They're dividing up my clothes. Yet, you're holy. I will tell of your name. I will praise the Lord. You get down all the way to the very end. All the prosperous of the earth, right? Everybody's going to bow before this God. Posterity shall serve him. Coming generations, a people yet unborn. That's us, by the way. That's us. What is the very last, what, five words of the 22nd Psalm? He has done it. You could translate that differently with no violence done it, the same way John wrote it in John 19.30. When Jesus does all of these things and he gets to the end and he says, after having quoted already, the 22nd Psalm. After watching the 22nd Psalm display itself in his life, his bones being counted, people wagging their fingers at him, people accusing him, people saying he trusted in God, let God save him now. People dividing his clothes, this was him. He lived all of this. And at the end, what does Jesus say? It is finished. You know what he said? I have done it. David did not know. I don't believe that he understood. I don't believe that it was David thinking he was talking about himself, though we sometimes exaggerate what we feel when we're going through those things. Lord knows some of us in this room understand what it means to feel forsaken and wrongly accused and that God has left, left town. But it wasn't this bad. 
And David says, we'll get to this point and he'll say he's done it. And what does Jesus say? I have done it. I have done it. It's done. That Jesus. That Jesus is the one whom we worship and rightly so. The one in whom we trust forsaking all others being joined to this one. This one who is sometimes referred to us as our groom and we his bride forsaking all others or you commit to this one till death bring us together dying to self living for Christ this Jesus is the Savior is it him in whom you trust who walks with you even when you don't feel like he's there he is there and when you wonder how in the world it could possibly get taken care of, whatever it is, remember a Jesus who said, after he was crushed by his own father's plan, by his own will, I've done it. It's finished. Amen.